Yeehaw! How y'all doing now? Whether you're up or way down low, don't you miss the Lucky Number Show. This week's lucky number is 58526. I'll repeat that. This week's lucky number is 58526. Match it and go to the radio tower. Great, Corsola, that's Chris's number. Here's something I never thought I'd say. Pokemon managed to turn the lottery of all things into something wholesome. The way it works is that the game will check a randomly drawn number from 0 to 65,535 against the ID numbers of all of your Pokemon in your party and in all of your boxes, and if any of them match two or more digits, you win a prize. Unfortunately, as I was most displeased to find out, the game actually reads the last digit first, and then the second to last digit, and then the middle digit, and so on. And if it finds any mismatching digits, it stops reading the ID number and says, okay, that's how many digits you've matched. So, despite the drawn number, literally having the first three numbers match up with Chris's ID number, the game actually matched the ID of the traded Onyx from earlier in the game, and used that to give me the prize. But yeah, the more you trade, the more chances you have to win, and coincidentally, did you know that the game actually does not read any Pokémon in boxes 10 to 14? There had to be at least one bug with it, right? This actually occurs because those boxes were not present in the Japanese version of the game. They had 9 boxes, each containing 30 Pokémon, and in our version, we had 14 boxes containing 20 Pokémon apiece. I don't really know why that's the case, but it's the same thing in Generation 1 as well. And speaking of dumb luck, look at what Chris found! Yes, Chris managed to encounter Entei, one of the legendary beasts, and although Entei is going to basically run away on the first turn, as he is wont to do, now that we've encountered him once, we can at least track his movements with a Pokedex. It will show where he is on the map. Unfortunately, he is constantly moving every time you change areas, so you kind of have to get lucky to land in the same route as he is at the same time. It's fine, really. This is something that you have to be prepared for well in advance anyways. So, we'll get to him eventually. But for now, though, wasn't his unique battle theme cool? They added that in Crystal version. And one last bit of housekeeping before we begin the actual gameplay today. Uh, I have some trades to make. Gold is going to trade his Kadabra over to Silver, who in turn will trade his Haunter over to Gold, and then they will switch them back. This is, of course, one of the trade evolutions in the game. You're probably familiar with this already. However, in Generation 2, they add something else. Uh, you remember that King's Rock we picked up? It's not just an evolution item like the stones were. Uh, to evolve something using a King's Rock, you have to trade the Pokémon while it's holding the King's Rock, and the King's Rock will be consumed, which means if you want to evolve something this way again, you have to find another one. Really annoying because if you don't know where to find another King's Rock, you might just restart the entire game to pick up the one in the Slowpoke well. Now, it should be noted that you can, in fact, farm King's Rock, so it's not like you have to restart the game, but it's still really annoying and the game doesn't really tell you how to find them. At any rate, there are two Pokémon that can be evolved with the King's Rock. Slowpoke will become Slow King and get a very nice bonus to all of its stats as a result, and Poliwhirl will become Politoed. From what I can tell, Slow King is basically Slowpoke with a very big stat boost, so probably worth getting one, especially at level 8 like mine is. And as for Politoed, it's not really that much different from Poliwhirl, so I think getting a Poliwrath would be better, but of course I have to fill out the Pokedex, so I have to get these anyways. One final reminder I should give is that anytime you send someone a Pokémon with intent to evolve it, uh, the person receiving the Pokémon will get both the pre-evolved form and the evolved form registered in the Pokédex. So if Gold wanted to totally, totally steal this Politoed, uh, he could and Silver wouldn't mind. But I don't think he's gonna get that kind of luck after that stupid pun, oh my goodness. Our next destination lies east out of Ecruteak City. You're technically allowed to go in this direction as soon as you have Surf, but there'd be little purpose because eventually you would hit a roadblock and have to double back to Olivine in Sionwood City anyways, and Sionwood is where you find Fly, so much easier to get the quick travel option first. We also have an optional dungeon on this route, Mount Mordar. There's not a lot in here at the moment we can access because you need all of the HMs to access everything, but there is a new Pokémon in here. Uh, it's most commonly found in Crystal version. It is Meryl. I remember this Pokémon very, very well. It was first revealed officially in the Orange Islands arc of the anime, but before that, I think it leaked or something and everyone assumed it was some kind of secret Pikachu evolution called Pika Blue. Anybody remember that from those days? 
I don't know how those rumors start up, but it does actually look a little bit like Pikachu. It is a mouse, and it's a water mouse at that. You know, one of the annoying trends in this franchise is that they like to create a clone of Pikachu every generation, a quote-unquote new Pokemon, but it looks so similar to Pikachu and might even have the same type. Honestly, if they made Meryl the so-called Pika clone, and then every Pika clone after this was a different type from the original, I think that would create a much bigger variety of Pika clones. Although sometimes a Pika clone will have a type other than electric. Sometimes. With that out of the way, next up on my agenda, as we exit Mount Mortar and return to Route 42, there is a trainer that Chris needs to battle. At first glance, there's not really anything interesting about this guy. He's a fisherman, his name is Tully, he's got a single Pokemon, a Pokemon that we cannot capture for a very long time, come to think of it, but that's neither here nor there, and I'm going to send out Cubone, who has picked up a new move at level 25, so that might be interesting. What's important about this guy is that, in Crystal version only, if you have this guy's phone number, he will randomly call you up and offer you a Water Stone. There are four such trainers like this, and they each give out a different Evolution Stone, but this happens only in Crystal version. You may recall that I mentioned that the Evolution Stones are now only available through Mystery Gift, or a single stone can be found way, way later in the game. Well, Crystal Version adds this, so you can get the Evolution Stones a little bit earlier, but you're still relying on a lot of luck to actually get them, because they have to call you and offer you the item. Here's a list of the trainers that give Evolution Stones. These are their names. So if you encounter them, be sure to get their phone numbers, in Crystal Version anyway. I mean, it's probably just a lot easier to send the Pokémon to Generation 1 and evolve them with a the stone bought from Celadon Department Store there. Again, nothing newly added in Generation 2 requires a stone from Generation 1 to evolve. Now then, as we enter Mahogany Town and I try to pass through to the next route, uh, this guy stops me and offers me a Rage Candy Bar. It costs the same as a potion and does the exact same thing as a potion, so I don't really know why you're offering it. Is this the Pokemart? I need to buy some items. Huh. This is a very suspicious stock. Slowpoke Tails, huh? Where have we seen all of this before? Being offered a shady item, finding Slowpoke Tails... Something's going on in this town, it seems, and the gym is actually blocked, so I'm going to have to head north, I guess. That's the only direction to go in from here, as soon as I get my Pokémon healed. You know, even by Pokémon standards, this is a really tiny village. It's got four buildings, no Pokémart, and it has a gym for some reason. I have no idea why they decided to set up a gym here. Ah, well, a gym is a gym, I suppose. We'll just have to do something to unlock it, I guess. Maybe the leader is up to something. In the meantime, you can find another new Pokémon on this route. Girafferig. Girafferig's name is a palindrome, meaning it reads the same backwards as well as forwards. And the interesting thing about him is... There's a bunch of leaked beta designs for Pokémon floating around, and Girafferix is interesting because it has a second head exactly like its first, instead of its tail. So you could say its body is also a palindrome. Now, getting back to the route we're in, if you surf across these little ponds here and then head north, you will find an alternate path that leads to something that's actually pretty interesting. It's a hedge maze of sorts. It's just a bunch of corridors lined with trees, and there are also some hidden items, including this full restore, which I'm going to have to throw away an item in order to make room for. I guess carrying around a dire hit and a guard spec was not a good idea. Those don't even do anything useful. Uh, anyways, this hedge maze... You know, I like to stay positive when I talk about this game, but I really don't like this hedge maze because it's got a bunch of trees that you have to cut through, and there's no grass for wild Pokémon to show up in. There's a bunch of headbutt trees, but there's really nothing interesting besides a bunch of item pickups, and the whole thing is just one big maze. And at the end, you find this house where you get the TM for Hidden Power. That's the signature move of Unknown, which is no longer a signature move because now any Pokémon in the game can learn it. I think even Caterpie could. Hidden Power, if you'll recall, has a different type and base power depending on the Pokémon using it, so I hope yours has a good type, because that might be strategically important for competitive play. Now, I took the grassy path through the route, but if you take the building path through the route, uh, it turns out Team Rocket has set up a toll booth. Why do I have to pay them? They're just two rockets, they've probably got useless Pokémon. Let me fight them and beat them up and send them packing! Why do I have to pay them? Well... Okay then, I guess I'm gonna pay them. It is faster to do that. 
Anyways, we have arrived at the Lake of Rage. This location is interesting for a couple of reasons. They actually let you fly to this location even though there's no Pokemon Center, and if you open your radio, uh, there's a very strange frequency being broadcast. I wonder what's up with that. Probably has something to do with Team Rocket, considering that we just encountered them. So something's going on in the lake, huh? Let's check it out. We surf up and we find a very interesting looking Gyarados. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Red Gyarados. For most players, I would bet this is the first shiny Pokémon they ever found, because it is a fixed encounter, this Gyarados is always shiny. Shininess is basically an alternate color for a Pokémon, it makes them a little bit more special. Uh, it doesn't really imply that they have better stats or anything, in fact, if they have shiny status in Generation 2, it means that they have suboptimal stats. So, you're not exactly going to see any of these in competitive play. Of course, in my case, I got a shiny Iggly buff out of that egg. And it did come down to the wire, I almost lost the Gyarados. This is a one-shot deal, of course you could just save and then reload if you accidentally knock out the Gyarados. But hey, free level 30 Gyarados this late in the game, I'll take it. I caught it on all three playthroughs, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna use it on all three playthroughs, we'll have to see about that. Regardless of whether you capture the Red Gyarados, you get an item called the Red Scale, which can be used for something later, I'll show you very shortly. After you've defeated or captured the Red Gyarados, you will find a new NPC right here. He might look familiar, as he did have a unique sprite in the previous game. It's Lance, the leader of the Elite Four. It seems he's investigating some trouble with the Lake of Rage. Of course, since this is Lance we're talking about, he might need a little bit of assistance from the player. A lot of it, in fact. And after you're done talking to him, he goes flying into the sky. I don't really know what's up with that. Did he use an escape rope or something? Weird. Anyways, forget him for now. It's time to backtrack all the way to just east of Violet City, where we can visit Mr. Pokemon and give him the red scale in exchange for a very important item. I don't know how you're supposed to conclude that Mr. Pokemon is where you take the red scale to. Maybe there's a hint to it somewhere. I don't read all the dialogue. But the item he gives you is the Experience Share, a very important item, a successor to the Experience All from Generation 1. This time around, you just hand it to one of your Pokémon, and they collect half the Experience Points from battle even if they did not participate. Oh, and I'm just showing that I evolved Spiro into Firo. She was one level away, so I decided to get that out of the way right now. Anyway, the EXP Share makes it very, very easy to level up a low-level Pokémon if you want to start using it later on in the game, especially if that Pokémon had no attack moves and is unable to battle anything realistically. So it turns out that that weird radio signal was causing all of the Magikarp to be forcefully evolved into Gyarados. Uh, where do you think the radio signal was coming from? Could it be the very suspicious shop? in Mahogany Town? I mean, there's four whole buildings, and only one of them is shadier than the others. Of course this is where it was. This is a secret Team Rocket hideout, and it's got a couple traps for you when you enter. So I don't know how Lance got past this so quickly, but when you step in front of the Persian statue, it triggers a battle with two Rocket Grunts. They're not that strong, in fact they're complete cannon fodder like most of Team Rocket, but you'll notice that the levels are in the 15 to 20 range. In fact, all of the levels in this entire dungeon are in the 15 to 20 range. The reason for that is, because you're allowed to go to Mahogany Town immediately after Ecruteak City, the game designers had to account for the possibility that the player might not be ready for this area if they had decided to come here immediately after Ecruteak City, and therefore did not gain any levels in Olivine or Sianwood City. Of course, the issue with thinking that way is if the player had gone to Mahogany Town first, then they might be overleveled when they reach Olivine City, so... There was some non-linearity in Gen 1 as well, and while I do like the idea of being able to collect the badges in any order you want, it's just going to be very, very difficult to find some way to balance the game around the possibility of the player going to any particular area last in their order. I mean, the latest generation is actually a pretty good example of this. In Gen 9, they have this massive open world that lets you go to the gyms in any order, but there's no form of level scaling, so if you over-level for one gym, every gym with levels beneath you are now going to be very easy and therefore boring. So any form of non-linearity needs some kind of foresight from the game developers. Oh, and by the way, if you want to turn off the alarm so the trainers don't keep popping up, just hit that switch on the computer. I don't know why it's that easy to shut off the alarm system, but whatever, not my hideout. 
Anyway, to keep a long opinion short, I think it would have been best if they put some kind of roadblock stopping you from going to Mahogany Town until you had gotten the badge from Sionwood. Maybe, like, put a strength boulder there and just make it so that you get the strength HM from Sionwood, and then put the fly HM in Goldenrod, I guess? Something like that. At any rate, if you take the short path through the room, you'll stumble across this minefield of sorts. Every step you take, you risk getting into an encounter with a Pokémon that knows self-destruct. I'm pretty sure all the Pokémon you can encounter here know self-destruct. And you can't escape from any of these encounters either, so have a Ghost-type ready, I suppose. That'll save you from self-destruct. It's actually possible to capture these guys, which I thought was really weird. So I guess these are wild Pokémon that they just shoved into the minefield and have them just pop up whenever someone steps on them. That's kind of mean. But I think you can actually find Pineco here if you didn't already find him through headbutting, so that's one way to get him if he doesn't explode before you manage to capture him. And even after you've booted Team Rocket out of the base, the minefield is still there and is still operational. The alarms aren't, but the minefield still is for some reason. I'm also still not sure how Lance got past all of these traps way, way quicker than I did, but he's here on this floor. Maybe it's the cape and he's secretly Superman. I mean, the cape is fitting for that. He also heals your Pokémon on this floor, which I actually like. It's possible for the player to go through a lot of traps on the way here, so a free heal is a good thing. And of course, there are still going to be more trainers, and it looks like the door in this room requires a password, so we're going to have to search for it. Which probably means fighting a bunch of trainers until we find the right one. And Lance pretty much confirms that's the case. You need two passwords, and they're only known to two rockets on this floor. So that means you're pretty much beating everybody until you find the right guy, which is not a terrible thing. I mean, their levels are still way low, but the trainers here actually give out quite a lot of money, especially the scientists. So if nothing else, you'll usually end this dungeon with a lot of money in the bank. Doubly so if you send it to your mother. And yes, I have edited out most of the battles because they're really not that interesting. In addition to the lower levels than usual, the trainers here mostly just use poison types. I mean, that's kind of Team Rocket's thing. They had a lot of poison types back in Gen 1. To be honest, I think there's a missed opportunity here. They could have had the Rocket Hideout function as a dark gym of sorts. As I mentioned, between Generations 1 and 2, there's a gym for every type in the game, including the new ones, except for Dark. So, if you put emphasis on the dark type here, that could have this place function as a dark gym without actually being a gym. This would also force me to use something other than Alakazam, because dark types are immune to psychic attacks. But then again, there are really only four evolution lines with the dark type in them, despite it being the hot new type that was supposed to balance out psychic types. So, I guess they couldn't really do much with that anyways. Anyways, that female rocket grunt had the first password. And this room right here has the Rocket Grunt with the second password as well as a couple other items. At this point, I decided to just leave items on the ground if they weren't worth picking up. I mean, Dire Hits and Ice Heals, those are just not worth it at this point unless you want to sell them for some extra money. Seriously, battle items are just not worth it because they take up an entire turn and they're not really setting you up for a whole lot. I mean, it'd be nice if there was maybe a berry that could function as a battle item. Like, if there was a berry that caused you to gain an X attack boost, but that doesn't happen until Generation 3, unfortunately. And even then, I don't know how much that would be worth, because in Generation 3, they also add a bunch of equipment items that do a lot more than a simple consumable berry does. Alright, so I guess I was lying when I said Team Rocket is comprised entirely of poison types. They've got a couple normal types in there as well. Why do they always have, like, the weakest Pokémon in the game? They're Pokémon thieves, they should be stealing the best stuff for themselves. In fact, their entire shtick in this part of the game is that they are forcefully evolving a bunch of Magikarp. Shouldn't they have, like, an army of Gyarados at this point, or is that too much for them to control? At any rate, we've got both passwords, so now it's time to open up that door. That trainer I just avoided, by the way, in gold and silver versions, he is unavoidable, but they changed him to a spinner in crystal version. And also, I've just picked up the TM for the move Thief, which allows you to steal items from the enemy. You can only steal a hold item, but there are actually Pokémon with hold items on them when you encounter them. This only occurs rarely, but now we can actually steal them instead of having to capture the entire Pokémon to see if they had one. So, that's pretty cool. Hey, speaking of thieves, the rival appears here as well, but he does not challenge us to battle because Lance already beat him. I'm honestly kind of disappointed. 
I mean, it's nice that Lance actually does something by getting rid of the rival for us, but like... In Silphco, you had to fight your rival, and Silphco also had an actual puzzle instead of this whole password thing, so the Rocket Hideout is really turning into a disappointing dungeon, and probably one of the low points of Gen 2. I mean, no generation is perfect, but this is one of the parts of the game that is really not working for me, if I'm gonna be completely honest. One of my goals here is to show you that Generation 2 is far from the worst in the entire series, like some people claim, and I think I've done that at this point, but I'm still gonna point out the low points when they appear, because there are some things in Generation 2 that are worth criticizing. It's just, the worst in the series? Come on, it took until this point for me to express disappointment with a dungeon. Everything before now has been pretty average at worst. Oh, and we're fighting a Rocket executive who, for some reason, has normal trainer battle music instead of the Team Rocket theme. That's really weird. Anyways, during that entire time, Hopip has been gaining experience points through the EXP share, and now he's reached level 18, which means he can evolve into Skiploom. He's got another form after this. They're not... Hopip's evolution line is not the most useful in the game, but I do appreciate being able to level up and evolve something without even having to send it out in battle if you've got the EXP share. Really great item. Makes this a whole lot less painful. Grinding in Generation 1 was monstrously awful, and I don't think anyone blamed me for using the rare candy dupe trick. Seriously though, why does the Rocket Executive not have any good Pokémon on him? This guy can't hold a candle to his own former boss, who actually used a pretty strong type of Pokémon. Also, there's a really subtle change to the following cutscene in Crystal version. They actually show the Rocket Executive running away for longer than they do in Gold and Silver. I don't really know why they made that change. Anyways, to get the password to the first floor door, talk to the Murkrow, that's apparently what this bird Pokémon is, and uh, it will give you the password, which is the easiest password to guess in the history of anything. Hail Giovanni, really? You know, now that I think about it, maybe the low levels of the enemies here could represent the fact that these guys really can't do anything without their boss. I mean, they have no good leadership, I guess. These Rocket Executives aren't even named, but they actually are in the remakes. Actually, this entire scene right here, I remember it very well from the remakes because in the remake of this game, this battle right here is actually a double battle with Lance as your partner, which was pretty awesome. Of course, in this game, it's just going to be a single battle with three Pokémon that are probably not that strong. You get to fight the female executive now. What does she have? Oh, she has Arbok. Well, that's nice. I only just fought a bunch of uh, Ekans on the way in here. Do these guys know they're basically leveling fodder? Because this is the point where I took the opportunity to raise my Machop a little more. It's actually getting very close to the level where it evolves. And then after that, I just have to raise a Graveler, and I will have all of the Pokémon that evolve by trade, without an item anyways. Ah yes, here's another one of those new Dark-type Pokémon, by the way. Murkrow. Maybe it's the same Murkrow that was seen earlier in the hideout. It's got a Flying-type attack, so it might be difficult for a Fighting-type, but due to its typing of Dark Flying, it does take neutral damage from the Fighting-type. Ah, just shy of level 28, huh? You know, a running problem with a Dark-type Pokémon is that while they have high physical attack stats, the Dark-type itself is actually a special type. So they don't really make use of their own type that well. Come to think of it, that seems to be an issue for a lot of Pokémon pre-physical special split, which was introduced in Generation 4 just in time for this game's remake, so a lot of these issues are mitigated or are outright fixed in the remakes. Some issues don't get fixed by the remakes, but I guess I'll talk about the remakes when I actually play them further down the line. Okay, Machop has finally hit level 28, so he will be evolving to Machoke at the end of this battle. Thank goodness, and Croconaut even got the chance to show off his Ice Punch. I really haven't been using the starters, or at least not as often as I did in Gen 1. It's a really different kind of feeling. The starters are actually underwhelming to most of what you can catch out in the wild, because you can actually use wild Pokémon now. It doesn't take forever to level them up like it used to. Of course, I'll remember to make room for the starters from time to time. Oh, and speaking of evolutions, Chris also managed to evolve Cubone into Marowak in this exact fight. Funny how that works, two evolutions in the same battle across two different playthroughs. And Marowak's not even at maximum power yet, oh no. 
Anyways, with the Rocket executives out of the way, it looks like this hideout has been officially routed. But they're not gonna give up that easily. You know how Team Rocket is. They'll be back, maybe more than once. Now all we need to do is get rid of that radio signal so the Lake of Rage stops living up to its name. Oddly enough. I mean, what else could the Rage part mean? Is it referring to, like, Dragon Rage or something? That doesn't make much sense. Anyways, the machine they have that's generating the radio signal is actually really weird because it's powered by Electrode. I don't know how they managed to power a machine that way. I mean, it makes sense. Powering a machine with an Electric-type Pokémon, that is something that they would do, especially if it involves abusing Electrode. But in this case, Electrode decided to abuse me because all three of them decided to self-destruct on me. I guess I don't need to make them faint, they'll make themselves faint. I actually wanted to capture one of them, because in fact you can capture them. I don't know why you can, but there you go. The signal has stopped, the lake is back to normal, and we've saved Mahogany Town, I guess. I mean, booting out Team Rocket is always a good thing, I suppose. And we received the HM4 Whirlpool. This is a move that has a couple uses outside of its obvious use of stopping the Whirlpools at Whirl Island. So now we can actually get in there. Not that there's anything inside at the moment. You still need one other item before you can actually see what is inside the Whirl Islands. But we might get to it soon. Or we might not. Who knows, I don't plan these videos out weeks in advance, I just look up what Pokémon to capture. If nothing else, I can be thankful that the path back to the surface is very quick and easy. You just touch this teleporter tile and it takes you right back to the entrance. Hope you didn't touch it on your first trip through the dungeon. Now then, I decided to do some grinding with Meryl because I looked it up and found that Meryl evolves into Azumarill at level 18, which is actually really convenient. You catch this at level 15, you only need to put three levels into it, which is really easy with the EXP share. And isn't this just the perfect Pokémon for me? An egg-shaped bunny, and we're actually getting close to Easter at the time of this video's recording. Only thing left is to take on the Mahogany Town Gym Leader. As you can see, the puzzle inside the gym is an ice sliding puzzle, and if you manage to get past that spinner trainer, you can take on the gym leader, Price. He's called Price. I know that rhymes with ice, but Price? Seriously? I don't understand. So he uses the ice type, obviously enough. So naturally, the first Pokémon he sends out is... wait for it... a water type. Okay, I know Seal evolves into an Ice-type, but there are a bunch of other unevolved Ice-types you could have picked, and it would have been fine. As far as difficulty goes, Price is somewhere between Jasmine and Chuck, which is not the kind of difficulty that Silver is used to at this point. Silver basically takes out Price by using Machoke. Fighting-type is good against Ice-type, so this should go very swiftly, especially if Karate Chop gets a couple critical hits in. It is a high crit chance move, but it's not a guaranteed crit chance like it would have been in Gen 1. Price's ace Pokémon is Pyloswine, which is a combination Ice and Ground type, which means Croconaw's Surf Attack can do extra damage to it. And Croconaw is also a good choice here because Water types resist Ice attacks, so I would not say this was difficult for Silver, just be sure to have some Ice Heals, because they can inflict free status if they are lucky. Since Seal is a Water type and Dugong is a combination Water-Ice type, this was very easy for Alakazam, just use Thunder Punch. There's a reason I taught it Thunder Punch all the way back in Goldenrod. And if I had Fire Punch, I could also use it on Pyloswine, but I decided to send in Quill Lava to finish the job. Ice is also weak against the fire type, I don't think I needed to tell you that, it's pretty obvious that fire melts ice. And I'm not actually sure if Pyloswine has any ground type moves. At any rate, it didn't decide to use any in this battle. Now I absolutely love the strategy I came up with for Crystal version. So the first thing I did was to knock the seal down into low health so it would use rest and go to sleep. Come to think of it, this strategy would be thwarted if that seal was holding a mint berry which would cure sleep, but no matter. So the next thing I did was to send in Azumarill. Azumarill naturally learns Defense Curl and Rollout. Defense Curl, in addition to increasing defense, also doubles the power of Rollout. Rollout itself is a move that will double in power every turn for 5 turns, however you are locked into using the move as soon as you select it, so you gotta be careful with it. Though it sounds impractical, Rollout also happens to be Rock-type, which is one of the other weaknesses of the Ice-type. 
but it's still really weak to just select rollout and expect it to do any decent damage against these ice types. They're pretty bulky. So I decide to use the seal to set up my rollout turns. If I can take exactly three turns with rollout against seal, then on the fourth and fifth turns, I will knock out the other two Pokemon in a single hit apiece. I should note that I got a crit on the third hit against Seal, which means that I might not have knocked out Seal on the third hit if I did not get that crit, but that's probably nothing a couple of extra levels wouldn't have solved. And also the ground type resists rock type, so I'm actually doing neutral damage against the pile of the swine, but as you can see, a max power rollout is enough to take it out and win the entire battle. It may seem like a costly strategy in terms of the amount of time taken to set it all up, but if you're creative, then the Glacier Badge and the TM for Icy Wind can be yours if the price is right! I'm gonna have to sit down and regain my composure after that. Oh yes, it seems you also need the Glacier Badge in order to use Whirlpool outside of battle. There are like seven HMs. I wonder what the one badge that doesn't enable an HM move is. I completely forgot. Well, I'm sure I'll figure it out later. Uh, we get TM-16, which is Icy Wind, a move that he didn't really use in the battle, but it's Ice-type damage in addition to lowered speed, so that might come in handy. I mean, you can hardly expect the guy to give you the TM for Blizzard, that probably would have been overpowered. You can't let the player have a freezing move that early, can you? Oh wait, isn't it purchasable at the game corner? Never mind. So we got a call from Professor Elm, it seems something odd is happening with the radio tower. And it involves Team Rocket? Well, I suppose if we want to know more, we should open up the radio and have a listen for ourselves. Let's see here. Oh dear. That's the Team Rocket theme playing on the radio. I wonder how that affects the random encounters. Well, it seems they've taken over the radio tower, so I guess we know what our next destination is going to be. Time to double back to Goldenrod. I suppose we'll have to take care of that next time. See you later, everybody.